fresh meat. Slasher movies can come in all forms. Whether it's sticking perfectly to the Agatha Christie style formula, or carving out a path all its own, there are many ways to succeed as a slasher movie. And I mean, add the two B's and you're in for all sorts of fun. But in the 80s and 90s when the MPAA was absolutely butchering the horror genre, filmmakers were forced to get creative. And we were left with some truly odd films. Join us as we cover a slasher you may not expect on today's Real Slashers. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We're finally doing a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie on this show, and it's the third sequel. But I swear I have good reasoning. It gives us two future Academy Award winners, and they're acting the shit out of this movie. Then there's Leatherface, who has gone from this scary wielder of motorized objects to this wailing, cross-dressing mess. So join us as we go through the insanity that is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. What if they're murderers and they want us to follow them so they can hide behind trees and stab us? There could be dead people buried all around us and we never know. You would think that having one of the co-writers of the seminal classic on board as both writer and director, that this movie would be set up to succeed. But Kim Hankel was more interested in making a cartoonish send-up of the whole series. And in some ways, he succeeds. In typical Chainsaw fashion, the film opens on some expository text and some John Larroquette knockoff voices it over. Here, they acknowledge the other films and even give us a bit of a timeline of the events. This is probably the only time I'd call the film traditional, because... Hooey! It goes crazy right from the jump as suddenly we're at a dance following some of the worst characters you can imagine. Heather and her boyfriend Barry are having some... Barry! Oh shit! Um, relationship problems. And despite this, he refuses to admit to it. I wasn't doing anything, I don't know what you're so pissed off about. Despite what we just saw. So we're pretty much rooting for this guy's death right off the bat. I want to thank you guys for watching Real Slashers, and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. The acting in this one is, um... All that, all that, all that, all that, she's such a bitch. Rough. But things get a little bit better when Renee Zellweger's Jenny gets introduced. See, she's smoking in the back seat with her friend Sean when Heather and Barry come storming out having a couple's argument. Zellweger is really one of the only decent actors here, but even then she has that trademark Zellweger nasally whine. Somebody gonna come with me? While driving, another car rams into them. Everything goes to hell from here. Most of the group separates and leaves Sean alone with the dead body. That's when we're introduced to Matthew McConaughey's Vilmer. You can tell right from the start that he's a psychopath. I'm gonna kill you. But I'm really curious as to what his plan was if Sean had just veered off from the road. I mean, look at all of those trees. He literally just had to get off the road. Instead, Vilmer runs him over. And over. And over. Amongst the slew of silly moments, and there are a lot of them, there is some genuinely creepy stuff. The image of Jenny in her prom dress in the middle of the woods is just filled with atmosphere. Then when Leatherface comes out squealing like a maniac, it's actually effective. I vividly remember seeing this trailer as a child and it scaring the ever-loving shit out of me. If I had watched it, I probably would have seen just how not so terrifying it is, but that's how the imagination works. They kill off everyone that's not Jenny, or well, they let Heather tag along for a bit, but she may as well be dead with how useless she is. I mean, look at her reaction to being set on fire. Jenny escapes a bunch, gets caught a bunch, and eventually we're left with the dinner scene. But we'll slice that up later. As you may have expected, Jenny escapes yet again. But this time, as she's running away, the Illuminati come flying down in an airplane and clip Vilmer. Yes, you heard that right. We'll get into that soon. Leatherface is distraught, and Jenny is saved by a mysterious limo. 
This is where it gets kind of confusing because you would think that they would just be killing Jenny since, you know, they're the Illuminati, but they instead drop her off at the hospital. How nice of them. We get this really neat final scene where some stars from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre appear in new roles. That's John Duggan as the cop, Paul Partain as the orderly, and that's Marilyn Burns as the patient. I suppose that's one way to bring back legacy characters. What are you gonna do? Shoot me? What if I do this? God damn it, Bill, but that in one bit! We actually have multiple killers to talk about in this one, because it's no longer just a one-man show. We've got Vilmer, W.E. Slaughter, Darla, Mr. Rothman, and of course, Leatherface. On top of the strange family dynamic that's always at play in chainsaw films, okay, fine, the strange family dynamic that's usually at play in chainsaw films is outshined by this really weird Illuminati subplot. That's right, the Illuminati are in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. The film supposes that Vilmer is on a mission from a higher power and is one of many crazy people that have helped shape the world into their image. They're behind the scenes. They killed Kennedy, all that stuff. Yeah, this guy. Like I told you, crazy pants. But the craziest thing is that McConaughey was first offered a very different role. And that role would have just showed up at the very beginning on a motorcycle, and then again at the end. He was essentially just Jenny's hero. But thankfully, McConaughey told producers that he should audition for Vilmer. Welcome to my world. Needless to say, the part was his. And it's no surprise, because McConaughey is a pure madman in this movie. He chews every piece of scenery that's within inches of him, and it's a sight to behold. Can you imagine anyone else in this role taking it this seriously? The craziest thing is that McConaughey doesn't even look down on the film. In fact, in his autobiography, Green Lights, he even mentions the role of Vilmer as one of his favorite roles to inhabit. Which, I mean, duh. I could watch this madman on screen for hours. But the craziest thing about Vilmer, outside of his performance, is his robot leg support. That's right, in the midst of this backwoods cannibal movie, one of the killers has this high-tech, well, high-tech in the same way that the Nintendo Power Glove is high-tech, leg brace. It's remote controlled and doesn't work how Vilmer wants it to. In fact, I don't think it works with any kind of logic. Then there's Darla, who has fallen under Vilmer's spell, and they have the epitome of an abusive relationship. She's been convinced that Vilmer put a bomb in her head. Those hoping that we'll see this plotline come to some kind of fruition will be disappointed, because it just essentially goes away. But Darla doesn't really seem to know what she wants, one minute seeming just as committed to murder as her lover, and the next helping Jenny out. Strange. W.E. Slaughter is the least featured of any of the new family members, and he even gets the hammer treatment in this one. So he also gets the smallest description. Then there's Mr. Rothman who shows up in a suit, and he just gives bad vibes throughout. He works for the Illuminati, or he is the Illuminati, I don't know, it's really hard to tell. But he's pretty much sick of Vilmer's bullshit, and he's here to keep things on track. Now, I'm gonna say something sacrilegious here, but Robert Jax may just be my favorite Leatherface. I know, I know, Gunnar Hansen is an absolute legend and is the definitive Leatherface. I agree. But in terms of pure entertainment value, I can't help but love this screaming psychopath. I find Leatherface to be at his most interesting when he has a lot of personality, and he feels like a deranged child here. There's this amazing scene when they first get to the house and Heather is waiting on the porch. Leatherface just creepily stands behind her and keeps trying to touch and smell her hair. When she finally notices him, he freaks out as much as she does. This whole exchange is hilarious. Really shows the moments from the original and puts a really dumb twist on them. Barry, I saw you. You were kissing her. Once. I kissed her once. What's wrong with that? 
Come on, it's like I can't even talk to my friends anymore. I can't believe how possessive you are. If you're into really crazy girls, then we've got the movie for you. Meet Darla, played by Tony Parensky. You may recognize her as the teacher slash stripper from Varsity Blues. And she really pushes it here with the crazy hot scale. Imagine if someone were to throw rocks at your windows. What would be the reasonable reaction here? Certainly not to flash them. But clearly you don't have the same line of thinking that Darla does. Jenny and Heather are both really cute, especially all done up in their prom ensemble. But don't think this is going to be some movie where you get to see a future Oscar winner naked. You're gonna have to watch Bridget Jones's Diary if you're wanting some of that. For the ladies, you've got McConaughey being his sweaty self, which I'm sure plenty are into. And I mean, let's appreciate all the effort that little old Leatherface goes through to make himself look so pretty for the big dinner at the end. Aw, oh, look at the little guy. You sit the fuck down. Oh geez, there are just too many great moments to choose from in this movie. What about when Jenny goes and gets this poor retired couple killed? And then she gets taken in by Mr. Rothman. Or Darla at the drive-thru with some cops behind her when she has Jenny screaming in the trunk? Or heck, even the opening where Barry is being a total sleazeball? No, no, no. This is a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie after all. And there's no better scene to slice up than the dinner scene. We've seen this scenario repeated time and time again since the first film. Our traumatized lead is tied up and forced to eat dinner with the family. Only Jenny isn't really tied up. She repeatedly escapes the house, only to be brought back in. We can see that Vilmer is at the end of his rope though, because he kills Slaughter out of nowhere. It genuinely feels like a, wait, did that just happen kind of moment. But yeah, he never comes back. Talk about an unnecessary character. That's when suddenly everything is turned on its head, and Mr. Rothman officially makes his entrance. You can tell right from the jump that something isn't quite right with this guy. I'm not sure why Jenny doesn't sense his bad vibes immediately. Well, he's got these very strange rings hanging from his stomach and has a pretty bad habit of licking faces. Rothman's had enough skin salt in his diet, so he leaves and Vilmer is a mess because of it. He starts cutting himself and writhing on the floor. So Jenny finally has a moment to escape. Someone really needs to get this family some rope. And they've been doing this kind of thing for like a thousand or two thousand years, I forget which, and nobody, I mean nobody knows their names. And that's who Vilmer works for. Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation premiered at South by Southwest on March 12th, 1995. Or, well, I guess I should say, Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre premiered at Southwest. Because that was the name they released it as. But when stars Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey started to blow up in Hollywood, the studio decided to rebrand the film and release it two years later as Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation. Oh, and they made sure to plaster their big stars all over it. A bit scummy, but hey, I'd say it worked. If you went to a video store in the late 90s, it was hard to pass up this cover. I mean, sure, once you got it home, most hated it, but still. People can be very salty regarding this movie. Just look at what somebody put in the IMDb trivia. Mistakenly known as a slasher movie, Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a horror thriller movie. The trademark element of slasher, sharp weapon killings, is non-existent in this movie. Yes, because a movie where a bunch of teens are needlessly killed doesn't qualify because they're only burned, hammered, and airplane to death. Don't slasher gatekeep. Plus, if you enjoy the film, you're in pretty good company. As last drive-in critic Joe Bob Briggs is a fan. And I mean, his favorite movie of all time is the original. Dinner, Leather, we got some more fun today! This was the final installment of the series until the remake in 2003 that started up a whole new timeline. 
That series has plenty of ups and downs, but they all tend to keep the idea of Leatherface and his family of misfits. Hopefully the current series can course correct and introduce a family for Leatherface to play off of, versus just the hulking Jason Voorhees path he seems to be on. I know that everyone has their vision of what Leatherface is, and I'm glad that those who wanted a brute force killer got their form of him. But can we get back to these days? Please? Hey!